And so what we've been attempting to do is to steadily work through the different classes of, of physical problems uh, that can be described by, by PDEs. Um, and the, I guess it op I opened it uh, in the wrong, um, I opened it in something that I can write on. Um, still is better. And so uh, these are what we have been working our way through. Uh, we talked first about fluid flow and diffusion, um, and the diffusion equation is if you substitute heads in here and permeability, hydraulic conductivity and storage coefficient in here and set this equal to zero, then you have uh, the porous media flow equations that we dealt with. And so we develop kind of a heuristic one-dimensional element and then a Galerkin one-dimensional element, then a two-dimensional element with triangular uh, with three vertices, uh, and then one with uh, isoparametric uh, with uh, both one-dimensional and also two-dimensional and other extensions. Um, and so that dealt with this zeroth order in space and first order in time and second order in space and zeroth order in time uh, components, of which we know that the uh, particular uh, conductance matrices are uh, something like the derivatives of the shape functions, a constitutive matrix, and integrated over the volume. Um, we know that this term on the right-hand side for this zeroth order term was something that was, well, we call it a storage matrix, and it was some coefficient multiplied by an integral of the shape functions, B transpose B dV. These are all matrices. So I suppose we should also make the case that basically this A matrix is equal to the derivative of the shape functions, which is the relationship between these. This is transposed here. And um, those are the two matrices that allowed us to be able to solve, first of all, steady problems with this part here, and then attempt transient problems by doing the time integration with this. So that was the basic building block that we had. One degree of freedom per node could be concentration, for us it was head, could be pressure depending on the, 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 the different kinds of uh, physical systems that we're dealing with. We took it the next step and we added a component which then represented advection. And so each of these, uh, so, so this was K diffusive if you like, K advective as I think we called it. was again an expression which was, I think, um, shape functions, velocity times the derivatives of the shape functions, as I recall. And um, that was the third kind of derivative that we had. So we have one, one derivative that looks something like d2c dx squared, which is this term on the top. We have one derivative that looks like change in concentration, not with space, but with time, which is this. And finally, we added one which is a derivative that relates to first order in space and zero in time, which is just change in concentration with location and multiplied by some something, velocity, typically for our cases. Um, and so by assembling those, we know that each of these uh, conductance matrices or storage matrices, as in the case of each of these, uh, we can assemble together in a relatively logical way. And they always look the same if they're representing this kind of PDE. For what, any given PDE, they'll always look exactly the, the same. And so now what we'd like to do is deal with uh, a couple of problems that are different and maybe more challenging. Uh, they're certainly different, and the, the two that we'll deal with are now to deal with uh, momentum transfer, and in two forms. One really is momentum transfer, Navier-Stokes equations, which allow us to look at 
at fluid flow in open flows. Most of the fluid flows that we deal with in porous media, the uh, momentum transfer uh, and losses in the system are taken care of by permeability, by viscous losses. And so they, they don't, we solve a continuity equation, which we throw Darcy's law into. And Darcy's law accounts for the change in pressure with time, a change in pressure with space, dpdx, which is exactly balanced by the shear forces, which are placed on the sides of the pores to, to, to guard against the pressure drop that you have between upstream and downstream. Bigger pressure upstream, lower pressure downstream, so there's a net force in this direction. So it has to be balanced by a net force, which is the, the shear stresses applied by the fluid as it goes through the pores medium. And so for flow equations, they don't actually solve momentum balance in a, a classical way. They solve continuity, and they include momentum balance by assuming a relationship between pressure and uh, permeability and viscosity, which is uh, the balance of the forces in the system. But if we want to solve open channel flows, where we, don't, we can't use permeability in that way, then we have to resort to uh, something like uh, Navier-Stokes equations. And Navier-Stokes equations and the solid mechanics equations are really quite similar. They, they satisfy one particular law, F equals ma, force equals mass times acceleration. So if all the forces are in balance in this, then it's not accelerating. If they're out of balance, then it will accelerate. And so that's the basic um, equation that's used to be able to formulate the momentum transfer equations, both in fluids where the constitutive equation we use is Newton's law of viscosity. And so Newton's law of viscosity, of course, is in simplest form, it says that shear stress is equal to viscosity times a gradient of velocity. Velocity in the y direction, gradient in the x direction. And um, that is the constitutive relationship that allows us to link uh, velocities and stresses. You apply a stress to a fluid, you get a velocity. The only difference between fluid mechanics equations and solid mechanics equations is that the constitutive law is different. In a constitutive law for solid mechanics, we're solving F equals MA, we substitute into it um, Hooke's law, which says that applied stresses give you a strain, not a strain rate. So. Uh, the, the main difference between these is that when you're looking at fluid mechanics, an applied stress, shear stress, gives you um, a strain rate, right? This is a strain rate. This, the units of this are velocity. The units are length over time divided by length, just from this thing here. So length over length is a strain. Over time is a strain rate. So this, this term here is equivalent to a strain rate. So stresses are related to strain rates through some coefficient. For solid mechanics, stresses are linked to strains through a constitutive matrix, which is Hooke's law. And this is Newton's law of viscosity. And so other than that, they're identical. One happens to relate to velocities. One happens to relate to uh, displacements, not displacements, right? strains. One happens to rate to strains, one happens to rate to strain rates. And it's just because of the difference between, between the fluid. You apply a stress to a fluid, it wants to move. You apply a stress to a solid, it moves instantly, an incremental amount, and then stays there. And so those are the, the problems that we, the, the systems that we'll now deal with. So we'll attempt to deal with the uh, Navier Stokes. And then solid mechanics. And then we'll start linking together solid mechanics with fluids and fluid transport, mass transport. So that's kind of the crux of, of what we'd like to, like to do. So we'll spend today talking about Navier-Stokes. Um, I won't derive the equations because I've said enough about uh, uh, them today. Uh, but we'll talk as to what they, they look like. Um, and then rather than do any ex extensive derivation, to drive the, you know, the, the final element equation, what we can do is we can convert our knowledge of what a zeroth order stiffness matrix looks like, a first order in space, or a second order in space looks like, and we can use those to figure out exactly what the final element equation should look like. So that's our approach for, for today. Um, so the Navier-Stokes equations are nothing more than balancing 
forces. Uh, you can look at it, this is a tensorial representation. Uh, so this is, uh, there are three components. Um, and this isn't perhaps particularly well put together. Skip through all this stuff, you can read that if you want. Um, but if you look at how these expressions look, which might be a better way to, to do it, um, the basic expressions uh, are that we solve, so we're, we're forging new territory now. Everything that we've done so far has dealt with one degree of freedom in each node, pressure, concentration. That magnitude has been a uh, scalar quantity, not a vector quantity. Um, but now we're looking at things which are tensile quantities. In other words, they have both uh, magnitude and direction. Forces. Forces have magnitudes and directions. And if we have a three-dimensional system, we'd expect to have forces in each of the three uh, directions. So the Navier-Stokes equations look like this in compact form. And uh, typically, what we're going to want to solve for, and I don't know whether, yeah, why don't I draw it? is if we think of our th simplest three-dimensional element, say a triangle, then you can imagine that at each node we would have uh, a velocity in the x direction, we'd have a velocity in the y direction, and a velocity in the z direction. So three degrees of freedom for that. Uh, and we would also have the pressure that is present within the fluid. And so if you want to solve this system of equations without knowing or solve this physical system that has three veloc velocities and pressures in the system, we know that we're going to have to come up with three equations to be able to constrain those, for th those three unknowns. And so indeed we have those. Um, if you resolve forces in x, y, and z just by f equals ma, then that's how you get this first momentum balance equation. Um, if you split it up into the three component uh, parts, then you have an equation that relates to velocities in x, y, and z, velocities in x, y, and z, x, y, and z, etc., and forces. So each one of these equations, single equations if you wrote it out, would be representing momentum balance in the x direction, or the y direction, or the z direction. Um, it's perhaps instructive to look at what if you think about exactly what this is, if we look at it just, this is a vector, but let's not worry about it being a vector. <coughs> this is actually equal to mass times acceleration, right? So acceleration, if we take it just in the x direction, you could also write it as mass times change in velocity. Um, okay, let's not. Let me do something else. So yeah, okay. Let me, so mass is equal to what? Mass is also equal to um, volume times density. So you could write this as volume times density, and you could write it as a rate of change of with time of um, rho v. And if you just break this out in terms of how you might want to rewrite this, we can write it as density multiplied by the rate of change of velocity with time, or we could write it out as uh, the velocity multiplied by the rate of change of density with time. So we can do that. Uh, but also, the other thing that we can do is we can also write this out as a uh, convective acceleration. So we can take this component, and even if uh, density doesn't change with time in our system, which would be an easy thing to do, um, we can allow us ourselves to be able to write this uh, as a second, a different component. So we could write this, for instance, as density multiplied through by the change in velocity with time. And we could also multiply it by velocity, sorry, velocity, yeah, okay, sorry. 
doing that very well. Get rid of this. So plus with time. Let's write it with terms of x. And so now, this term here is how the x-coordinate changes with time. This is basically velocity. And now this term here is how uh, velocity changes with location, which is a convective acceleration. So in other words, this term here on the left-hand side is nothing more than f equals ma, where we have a rate of ch a change in acceleration with time. So if you take a little block in your element, in your mesh, the velocity is changing with time. That is a, an acceleration. Or if you go from this block to the next block, and the velocity is different, then it has to have speeded up to get there. And you have to have expended force to do that. And so you're balancing those two forces. So you're balancing forces against a uh, static acceleration, if you like, dv change in velocity with time, which is acceleration and a convective or spatial acceleration. That's all that is. All the units of this have to be in um, units of force, force per unit volume, typically. Um, the gradient of pressure is a pressure change over a length, which is um, a force uh, per unit volume, also. And this is the drag that's exerted by the viscous forces in stopping all these little blocks of fluid squeezing past each other. So we're not going to drive it, but we'll talk about those, those the components. So they all have to be in the same units because we're adding apples to apples. If we have three equations, we write those equations in terms of velocities in the x, y, and z direction. But if we have four variables, then we need an extra equation to be able to close the system of equations. And we do that by making sure that we have this continuity expression, which is just a fancy way of saying volume in equals volume out. So if you write it in longhand, it looks like change in velocity uh, uh, in the x direction with x plus change in the velocity in the y direction with y plus change in velocity in the z direction with z is equal to zero. And the reason that that is continuity is that if you think about this being a little unit cube, and if this unit cube is moving at some amount uh, velocity x plus uh, delta x dv dx, and this is moving at velocity vx, then this thing has to be getting this much longer in a given time. And so if you're keeping the same volume, then this boundary here has to get shorter by this velocity in the y direction being in the opposite direction. So don't worry about the third dimension. But physically, all this is saying is if you imagine this is a piece of rubber and you stretch it in one direction at some rate, then the vertical shortening has to be at the same rate to keep the same area. That's really all it's physically saying. So that's just uh, an interpretation of that. And so if we solve the momentum balance equation plus the continuity equation, we have three of these, we have one of these, and we have enough to be able to solve for all of our um, variables, four variables in the system. We can write it out in longhand, which is what equations three and four are. You can play around with this if you want to make this, uh, uh, f take this further. And if we want to deal with it in two dimensions, then we just look at behavior in two dimensions, in x and in y. And we set the velocities in the z direction to equal 0. And then we don't care about that final relationship. So in other words, if we take this, and you'll see that now we don't have a term which is vz, because velocity z is 0. And so that's dropped out. And so if we deal with it in two dimensions, we have two equations for the momentum balance written for x and y and one equation for continuity which is exactly this sheet being pulled in one direction and shrinking uh, stretched in one direction and shrinking in the other direction which is a physical interpretation if you like of the, the continuity direction. So this is the system of equations that we might want to solve.
Um, and so to do that, you notice that we have in here, we have a second order component, a number of them. We have a first order component and another first order component, a different one. And I guess we have some zeroth order components as, as well. And so perhaps we can go back to what we know about the different systems we have, and maybe we can put this system of equations together just from our knowledge of what these second order and first order expressions look like. So that's what we're going to attempt uh, to do today. So that's basically what this page is all about. So these are the two expressions that we want to, to represent. We recognize the fact that if we look in uh, one of these expressions, we have all of the components in terms of the terminology we've used already is for something that changes with time. I guess I've thrown that term away. We lost that term, right? These are, so the other thing that's happened is that these are steady state. So we've done two things. It's not only in 2D, 2D but it's also steady state. So in other words, terms like change in velocity in the x direction with time are all equal to zero. So, so we lose this term here. So if we do that and write it just for two dimensions, uh, we end up with that, this, this system here. And again, we notice second order derivatives, first order derivatives, and no zeroth order derivatives uh, because we've got rid of those. And so what we could do is we could simplify it and we could uh, get rid of the convective acceleration terms yeah, just because we like to make it a bit more tractable. So let's get rid of these convective acceleration terms. I guess it's the same as saying that density is small. If density is small, then all of the losses would be by viscous losses uh, in comparison to inertial losses. So you lose velocity by it being viscous and therefore shearing against itself rather than having to apply a force to speed it up or speed it down by, by countering against inertia. And so if we get rid of those, we end up with a system of equations that we can represent like this. So we'll only end up with uh, this term, this term, and this term. Again, we have three separate equations. We have three unknowns. Um, we're going to use the simplest possible um, geometry we can for an element, and that would be a velocity in the x direction, a velocity in the y direction, and a fluid pressure at each node. Three degrees of freedom per, uh, per node, and therefore we need three equations to be able to satisfy that, which we have. Two momentum balance equations, one uh, continuity equation. And so what we could do then is we could look at the individual terms, and we know, for instance, that this is this zeroth order term. So in other words, sorry, first, order, first derivative term. So this is our advective matrix, which we know how to get, because we, um, I guess I closed the, the window, I think. I think yeah, I did close it. Um, this is this first order derivative term, and we know exactly what that matrix looks like. We also know what the diffusion term looks like. It's this second order term. We know that. This is what? This is A transpose dA dV. This one is something like uh, integral uh, shape functions, velocity derivatives of the shape functions time over the volume. And um, yeah, we don't necessarily need to, to, to worry about this one. This is just going to be good. We don't have this term anyway. And so what we could do is in looking at this expression, we have, uh, what would it be? fx would be equal to plus dp dx minus mu 
these terms, right? And so if we write that, I guess I've write, written it slightly differently um, in this case. So yeah, so this goes to be negative on this side. Um, looks like there may be a, ah, doesn't, don't worry about this, the sign change for now. So this top expression is just this force that's moved on to the left-hand side. The first order derivative, which operates on fluid pressure, and the second order derivative, which in this case operates on velocities in the extraction picture. Uh, so these forces in this case will represent for the, the fluid pressure or the single phase fluid, like on uh, boundary directions? It represents uh, pressures. No, it represents um, a, a body force. But it's, it's, a, it's the equivalent force which is applied to it. Um, it would be, um, well, it, it would be um, density times gravity. It would be a body force. Yeah. It would be the body force, vertical body force. So only one of them would have a component, right? So, yeah. But, yeah. And, uh, so we assume that the velocity in the x and y direction is constant, so we can say that the body, the Oh, we, because what? Because one is going to be easy. I mean, you can solve you can solve with both, but we're going to assume that the density is very small. So it could be air, in which case uh, inertial forces, which really what that that portion on the left hand side is mass density multiplied by uh, a convective acceleration. So mass times density is just uh, equivalent to inertial force. So we just assume that it has very little inertia. That's what you do. Out of a convenience. So this term here, we're just assuming that it's Stokes flow. We're assuming that density is, is tiny. That's all. Just out of convenience. Because then we can do this uh, much more straightforwardly. So that's our assumption. So we can do that for the first expression, uh, which allows us to write it in terms of the velocities in the x. We see up here that these are only velocities in the x direction. In the second equation, they're only velocities in the y direction. And so we can write the y equation in a similar way. The pressure gradient is in the y direction. So that's what this subscript is that we're going to remember. Um, superscript is that we're going to remember. So here the superscript 1 means first order derivative. The superscript subscript, subscript 1 means first order derivative. Subscript 2 means second order derivative. The superscript x means first order derivative in the x direction, which is this term here. And y means in the, in the y direction. Um, and these two are both combined, both x and y, so that those aren't split out. And so what we have then is we have uh, three matrix equations. Um, each of these are going to be vectors, right? These are going to be, if we wrote this out, this would be equal to fx at node 1 fx at node 2, fx at node 3, just for this top component here. And so in other words, this is nodes 1, 2, and 3. And this is the force in the x direction at node 1, sorry, 2. Force in the x direction at node 1 force in the x direction at node 3, etc. And for this term on the right hand side, so this would be a 3 by 3 matrix. And this vector of pressures would just be a pressure, not a, not a vector. So it's, it is not underlined. This should be underlined. This should be underlined. This is pressure. Um, no, sorry, that's not right. These are nodal values of fluid pressure. Um, this is our second order matrix, which is 3 by 3. These are uh, three magnitudes of velocities, and this is a scalar value of viscosity. Yeah. So these underlines are correct. Vector, matrix, vector, scalar, matrix, vector. Likewise for the forces in the um, 
y direction. And then the continuity one is just a first order derivative in the x direction and a first order derivative in the y direction, but acting individually on x in the first case and on y in the second case. And the transpose is just to, to make that work appropriately. And so if you step back from that, so these would all be individual vector matrix, vector matrix, vector, scalar matrix, vector, matrix vector, matrix vector. And so altogether, these represent a 9 by 9 matrix. Nine equations, and, well, not, and, and the individual um, components will be, ultimately will be a 9 by 9 matrix. But for now, there are nine equations. So I guess perhaps we should just talk about it in terms of nine equations. Three for uh, balancing momentum in the x direction, three for balancing momentum in the y direction, and three for prescribing continuity. And they're written in terms of, uh, there are three of them because there's one equation for node one, one equation for node two, and one equation for node three. So it gets a bit uh, convoluted, but nonetheless. So these represent our discrete equations. So what we could do is we could separate the terms into the main variables that we want to solve for. We said that at each of these nodes, we have variables of forces in the x direction, or velocities, forces in the y direction, or velocities, and fluid pressures. Right? Remember when we talked about uh, Darcy's law, we have a fluid pressure or a head at a node, and we have a velocity at the node. If one is prescribed, you solve for the other one. They're complementary. Same here. If we have forces at the nodes, we can solve for uh, velocities, etc. So we have complementary conditions. All defined in terms of the global x and y coordinate system. And so what we'd like to do is be able to solve for our principal variables. Principal variables are velocities, two velocities, and one fluid pressure. Velocities, 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 velocities. And fluid pressures. So what we can do is we can just rewrite that upper equation in a slightly different way so that we keep all the terms, the velocity terms in the first column, the velocity y terms in the second column, uh, and the pressure terms in the third column. And then we take the dependent variables out, which are individual vectors and matrices, and we finally rearrange it into this form here. And so this is a vector of velocities. This is velocity in the x direction of node 1, velocity in the x direction of node 2, and the velocity in the x direction of node 3. And likewise, velocities in the y direction, node 1, all the way down. So I'll undo that. And fluid pressures at nodes 1, 2, and 3. So a bit convoluted, but these are all uh, sub-matrices. These are the other matrices we know. This is our second-order matrix. This is our second-order matrix, pre-multiplied by viscosity. And these are our uh, first-order matrices in the x direction and in the, the y direction, because they represent only, unlike, if we go back here, in each of these expressions, it represents the pressure gradient in the x direction, there is no dp dy, but there's a velocity gradient in both x and y. So that's the reason that we have um, these written only in the x direction or y direction that we can, can modify for. And that's basically our system of equations that we have to deal with. So I, I don't know whether that's clear by deriving it through 15 pages of math or not, but it's kind of a, a physical way to start thinking about it. And really all we're doing is taking the component um, behaviors that we have for first order, second order, and zeroth order expressions. We know what those look like for a triangular element, and then trying to um, assemble it from that. And so uh, let's go through something. Maybe look, let's look at EGE FEM to see how we might do that. And if we have time after that, we'll use COMSOL as well to solve the same uh, system of equations. Um, I don't know if any of you, uh, I remember just before um, 
I left uh, after the last class. I sent you a long email with uh, uh, the data file for uh, Comsol for transport and reactive transport. I don't know if any of you use that. Um, if you did, I think uh, you'd find out that any modeling is really kind of analogous to detective work. So you were fortunate in that case in that you started off with a code that was written that did all of these things and you could start turning things off. And so when you turn things off, you could see what other component behaviors were and you could make sense out of it that way. I think modeling, a mistake that people who begin modeling make often is they develop the most complicated model they could think of that includes everything they, they want into it rather than doing it incrementally. So if you're doing advection diffusion, maybe you put together the diffusion part, you check whether it works. You put the advection part in, you check whether that works with the diffusion turned off. Put them both on, check whether it works. Look at reactions, turn off all the, 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 um, the spatial parts and just solve for the reaction uh, equilibrium behavior as we did in class uh, with that. And so that's the way that it's always useful to do it. And so the moral of the story, I think, is um, the expression Gigo, Gigo, garbage in, garbage out. So if you put garbage into a computer program, you shouldn't be surprised if garbage comes out. And so validation and verification are important things to do to be able to make sure that you're on the right track. Um, I suggested you might try that with the, the Comsol stuff we did before. I don't mind whether you did or not. It's up to you uh, as to whether that is. But let's try looking at, um, when we look at this system, let's try to validate what we're attempting to do against some solution we know. And one convenient solution that we can use uh, is flow between two parallel plates. Standard solution. The same as flow in a capillary tube, which is used for getting equivalent permeability magnitudes. Uh, flow between two parallel plates is often used to, as an equivalent for getting flow within a fracture. Uh, it's used, for instance, to give you an equivalent permeability of porous of fractured media, which is something like the aperture cubed divided by a factor times the spacing between the individual fractures. So the aperture is the distance between the parallel plates. The spacing is the distance between the next parallel plate, uh, which is parallel to it. And so whether it's a capillary or uh, whether it's flow between two parallel plates, the velocity distribution, as you go downstream, as you apply a pressure upstream, which is different from a pressure downstream. So I suppose if we drew this along the length of here, it would look like this, a pressure gradient. Once it's fully developed between the plates, it's always the shape of a parabola. And if you take the, the section around the middle part of that um, two parallel plates, then the velocity distribution is given by this curve. So this is one parallel plate here, which the velocity in this x direction is equal to zero. And it's equal to zero because that's a boundary condition. It's attached there by viscosity. Um, and uh, everywhere else, viscosity is acting up to the mid-plane. So this, I guess, yeah, I always use this. Uh, this is 2b. So I guess this is, permeability is 2b cubed. So I guess it's 8b cubed. I always use this. So that's that's the correct one for permeability. And so the other part of this is this parabola returns back to zero as you go further up here, where this amount here would be an amount equal to, to B. And so what we know is the, um, the solution for solving the Navier-Stokes equations, actually the Stokes equations, you don't have to deal with the part which includes the inertial term because it's... Um, it's not, it doesn't act in this particular system. It can be as dense as it likes. It won't make any difference because the, this term, there is no change in velocity in the x direction um, at, at all. Uh, well, actually, no, there is no change in velocity in the y direction as you go in the x direction. So this term is zero, and there is no velocity change in the x direction as you go, no, sorry, there is no change in, there is no velocity in the y direction. So this term drops out, right? What, what terms are going to drop out? There's going to be a velocity in this direction everywhere, but the velocity in the y direction 
has to be zero because everything is just moving down like a laminar sheet. So the, the particle of fluid which was here is moving parallel to itself, and so the velocity in the y direction is zero. And so even if we dealt with this particular term which had this term in it, the term this velocity is zero, this velocity is zero, and the change of the velocity in the um, y, uh, this is going to be finite, the change in velocity in the y direction with x is zero because it's, yeah, there, there is no magnitude, right? Vy is zero, so the change in this has to be zero, and the change in this has to be zero. So uniformly, this inertial term drops out, and so it could be as dense a fluid as you like, and this is still the appropriate expression to be able to define this, this behavior. Um, and this uh, velocity says that as the y-coordinate is equal to b, so this is um, y equals 0, this is y equals b, plus or minus b, it doesn't matter because it's, it's uh, squared, then this term will be equal to uh, 0, velocity has to be 0, and the maximum magnitude is going to be where the y is equal to 0, where it's going to be equal to whatever the uh, half uh, width of the, the fractures are. So we can get a, an expression for the magnitude of this, this velocity. Uh, if we calculate the maximum magnitude, it's going to be at this point where y equals 0, and it turns out to be 4 divided by the viscosity of the fluid. For the case, I guess, where this pressure gradient is equal to, it goes from 1 upstream to 0 downstream. It does over a length of 2 meters. So dp dx has to be equal to 1 over 2. 1. Didn't put units in, but uh, the units be consistent. So yeah, this, this term here. It's equal to a, a minus a half because this is the x direction, this is the pressure, and this would be a positive gradient, this would be a negative gradient. So this, this is this. So the bottom line is we can get a magnitude which is equal to um, the, the, the pressure change with depth. You can use this expression um, to get the magnitude. So we're going to choose a geometry for our system, which is 4 high. Um, it's a half geometry. Uh, we could guess what the conditions would be here. The velocities in the y direction are going to be 0 on this boundary. The velocities in the y direction are going to be 0 on this boundary, but also they are going to be 0 in the x direction just from what we've said, right? It's stuck to the edge of this uh, conduit, so the velocities at these nodes are equal to zero. However, the velocities at these nodes are all going to be finite. It's f just taking uh, one segment across the width of this system and dealing with that. This turns out to be a zero velocity boundary, even though it isn't the upper boundary, and it's a zero velocity boundary because it's uh, in the y direction, because it's that by symmetry, uh, in this case. Uh, and I suppose, actually, the, well, it'll solve for the fact that the velocities in the y directions at each of nodes 3 and 4 would also be 0, but we don't have to assume those as, as boundary conditions. And so we're going to solve for this particular geometry where we have two triangular elements that are represented in the system, uh, upstream pressure, downstream pressure. And so I guess the other thing that we'd have to know is that the pressure here is going to be some pressure that we define just from our boundary conditions. Okay. So that's going to be the, the, the behavior that we'd like to, to represent. And so now the next step is to be able to figure out, I'm just going to kneel on this, uh, is to be able to figure out exactly what the system of equations is going to look like. We've got some inkling of what it is. We know it's going to be a function of um, second order, second order, and first order matrix equations we have. But we have to assemble it appropriately. So there's a couple of things, I guess, that we would want to figure out. One is it's not going to be very difficult for us to recreate exactly what these um, conductance matrices are. 
But the final uh, solution that we have for this, ultimately, oh, that's actually quite comfortable. Um, <laughs> he says in the eighth, ninth week of class, having realized that. So the other thing that we need to do is be able to figure out exactly how we solve these uh, matrices. So we know that when we, if we look at this matrix, this is going to be 3 by 3, this is going to be 3 by 3, this is 3 by 3, 3 by 3, etc. So we know that this is going to have nine entries. We know that this is going to be nine entries because it's three by three. There's a missing three by three here, right? And they happen to be ordered in terms of the equations for um, velocities, then uh, velocities in the x direction, velocities in the y direction, and then velocities in the, the p or pressures. When we solve the system of equations, what we would want to do is we solve it typically around a degree of freedom. So we would typically rewrite the system of equations so that instead of looking like this, which is right now they look like force in the x direction at node 1, force in the x direction at node 2, force in the y direction, this is an x, right, in node 1, forces in the y direction at node 2, forces in the y direction at node 3, and then the other terms are just null. So that's the way that the equations are arranged in this particular format. But you know that when we've put the element matrices together, we've always done it, and well, we've, we've done it for nodes 1, 2, and 3. So typically what happens is that these get rearranged, so it ends up being, I guess, node-centric. Node so we would change it so that the force in the x direction at node 1 is the first, but then the force in the y direction at that same node is the first, and then this term here. So this, this, and this are just being regrouped. And then if we take then the force, the second node, the force in the x direction, the second node the force in the y direction, and the second node, the continuity equation, and then finally, the third node. So we don't have to worry about that now, but what we will do is we'll rearrange this system of equations before we solve it into this form, but we'll put them together in this form. So, see if you can kind of remember this and see if uh, it makes sense what we talk about with this expression. All right. Um, we've used this a number of times. This, you, you, we know that we can solve one, two, or three-dimensional problems. We can solve uh, diffusion, advection, advection diffusion, solid mechanics, Navier-Stokes problems, all in the same um, very simple code just, for, uh, just by using the, the typical structuring of finite element codes. And so that's what this main engine allows us to do. So what we do is we call a well, we call a particular data file, and in that data file we describe the element that we want to call to be able to solve. And the element subroutine is this one. Um, I, I'm trying to remember what the uh, nomenclature is. I think two is for two dimensions, and three is the, for the third class of problems. So I think the we solved the diffusion equation, which was 1 for this last number. A diffusion advection equation, which was 2. This is 3. And I think 4 is the solid mechanics equations. And so what will these uh, expressions look like? Everything is localized here. So let's try and explain what's going on. Second order stiffness matrix, capacitance matrix, sorry, um, damping matrix, right? So this is the second order term. This is the uh, first order term that we've used uh, for velocities, and this is the damping zeroth order in time, so just zero them. Uh, we get some information to represent our problem. We use the density. Actually, we don't use the density. Our density is zero. We use a viscosity, which we prescribe. We have a thickness of the element into the page, um, which we need to do.
And if we think about what we want to do, we know that we need to get this second order expression here, which is going to be our, you'll remember this, right? This is A transpose D A uh, DV. It's an integral, but because it's a triangular element, it's just, uh, it's not an integral anymore. It's just multiplied by the, whoops, by the volume. You remember this matrix here? We could get rid of the integral just because the values of the dependent variables, um, no, the derivatives of the dependent variables were zero. And so we have a velocity prescribed at each node. If we're mapping between those different velocities, the surface that does that is this plane. And the derivative of this plane is a constant, and therefore it's a constant um, rate of change of I guess it's a constant strain rate element, right? These are velocities, so they're changes in velocities, um, and the velocities are different at each node, but the surface that links those velocities, if you like, is always going to be a plane, and the derivative of that plane is always going to be constant. So in other words, the, the change, I guess what it's saying is that dvx dx equals constant just as in our fluid flow element, the heads were different at each node. The derivatives of the heads multiplied by hydraulic conductivity give you a velocity, and therefore uh, the velocity is constant within the element. So here the velocities are prescribed at the nodes, and so the rate of change of velocity must be constant because it's a surface. And so if that's the case, then this is true, right? We throw away the integral, uh, and we just make it multiplied through by the area times the, the thickness. And, well, I got, have that in your note. Actually, you have this in your notes. If you have your notes, you have this element right here. So if you want to, to write things on that, um, you can do that. Well, actually, it might be better to write it on there here. So, so here we go. And so this first part is doing what? Uh, you'll recognize these terms. This is just making K2 is equal to A transpose dA times the area of the element, times the thickness, I guess. So let's see if we see that. This is, um, the area is D2 over 2, so this is the, this is the A matrix. This is 1 over the determinant, 1 over the area of the, um, 1 over 2 times the area. So this is this term here is one over two times the area. This is the coefficient which we called, I think, uppercase. Remember, we had a matrix that looked like this. It was a two one, a two two, a two three, a three one, a three three, a. Th Sorry, it's A32, A33. And that's exactly what this is. These individual terms here were just the, the differences between the coordinates of the x and y of the nodes, which is exactly what, whoops, what these are. One minus each other. And so we have... Uh, this term here is this, this term here is this, and the third term is the last one. And on the second row, it's again these, these three terms that go together. And so this matrix here ultimately gives us this um, A matrix. And then we take this and we take, so this is what we call our, our A matrix. And to get our K2 matrix, we do this. We take A transposed, our constitutive relationship, and A, multiplied by the area, and multiplied by the thickness. So if you've been playing around with this at all, you, you recognize these. So let's take our constitutive matrix, and instead of making it something useful, interesting, just make it a, a 1, 0, 0, 0 matrix. And the reason for that is that by multiplying this whole term by this matrix, which maybe just looks like this, 
this allows us to get our derivative or second order derivative that only varies as a function of x because this is in the x location. If we want the one for y, then we just multiply by the opposite. So this is our second order derivative and with respect to y. So that's all we're doing with these. So we're defining a constituent matrix which is just convenient for us to use. It has a zero on the bottom which allows us when we multiply it by this it just gives us the terms which relate to uh, the second order terms in x direction. So in other words if we go back to this relationship here whoops didn't mean to do that. In other words it only gives us the terms which relate to this. And those terms are the terms right here. Um, yes. Yeah. So it's a bit convoluted. So maybe it is easier just to do the derivation with all the math, but I, I think not. It's kind of fun to, to try and do it this way. So this is A, this is A transpose, and this is D. Um, it's multiplied by the area, it's multiplied by the thickness, and so that's exactly what this is. And so second order in X is exactly, is this, this is just my terminology for, well, you can guess it, right? K second order as a function of X, get cramp. The second one is exactly the same, but it's second order in Y, so this is going to be K second order with respect to Y. And this is exactly, so these are these, so we need this one here, uh, yeah, so this is, this is this one here, and this one here. These are the magnitudes we have, okay? So, all right, so where, where are we going with this? The, so these are the, the second order matrices, so we have that. The first order, we do the same thing. Again, we know that this first order matrix looks something like, what is it? Is it, um, it's B transposed times velocity times A multiplied by the area. So this is our first order matrix. If we choose these velocities to be turned on either in the X direction or in the Y direction, then we can get this equal to either x or y, just because we're taking out the other terms. Because the velocity in the x direction is zero, so it just throws away those terms. And so that's exactly what we do here. Um, these are the, the transpose of velocities. This is the A matrix that we have from here. And this factor is So it's what we talked about when we put together these advective matrices, the fact that we don't have the shape functions per se, but we can just take uh, this first term, B transpose integrated. You remember that B transposed all integrated was equal to what? Physical description of it was just that it was a, a triangle element. The shape function would look like this. And so the integral of this over the volume is just the volume of this little wedge. And so the volume of this wedge is a third of the area, a third times the area of the triangle, if it's one high. And so this term here is exactly this. It's um, one over three times the area. The area gets put in here. And so maybe I'm going through this in too much detail, but the bottom line is that we end up now with these first order matrices which we call first order in X and first order in Y. And then we put together the conductance matrix, which is now going to be, if we just scoot back up here, it's going to be this. It's uh, this component here multiplied by viscosity, uh, a null, a 3 by 3 null term here, and a 3 by 3 term, which is the first order derivatives multiplied in the X direction. So let's see if we have that. Viscosity times the second order matrix, a null matrix, and the first order matrix. Uh, 
viscosity times uh, the second order in x plus the second order in y. So actually we don't need to separate them, I just did. Uh, we're adding them back together again. So I guess what we could have done is just instead of doing this as 1, 0, 0, 1, we just need to do it as 1, 0, 0, sorry. Instead of doing it separately in the x direction, y direction, we could just combine them together. Um, the second component on that top line is a null matrix, which is just a 3 by 3 matrix, there's nothing in it. And the third component is this one here. And so let's just skip back to here. It's a bit, so it's this. This is the second order for both directions, null and first order in X. On the next row, we'll have a null matrix, second order, and first order in Y. So null viscosity times the second order in both x and y, and then the first order in y. So that's the second line. And then the third line are the remaining ones that go here. And so once we've done that, we've actually put together everything that we need to be able to put together this, uh, this conductance matrix, which we're going to solve. And we're ultimately going to solve it as uh, b equals a x, right? It's just a matrix equation. I'm not sure. We should, I guess we should call it something. F equals k, I guess, velocity, right? Instead of um, displacement. So apply a force, stress, you get velocities. The term that links them together is this stiffness matrix. Okay? And so now we, we have this matrix. And we've just put it together from what we know about uh, this original partial differential equation. We know what the second order terms look like. We know what the first order terms should look like in a finite element sense. We know what the zeroth order terms should look like. And we've now put this together. Right now it's put together in terms of these three groups of, I guess, nine groups of three by three matrices. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I said before that when we solve it, we typically don't solve them in, term, in this way with all the values of the x forces, the y forces, and the continuity parts, we do it on a node-by-node -node basis. So we now rearrange this, this whole system so that we just swap rows and columns so we get it for node number one, node number two, and node number three. And so for node number one, this is momentum conservation in the x direction, momentum in y, and continuity. For node number two, this is momentum in x, momentum in y, continuity, etc. And so we have to just do a little bit of gymnastics to do that. And so this final part is basically doing that. It's taking velocities. I wrote it as forces on this left-hand side here. But obviously, these forces relate to these velocities. Velocities in x, velocities in y, and pressures. So the way we have it right now is velocities in x velocities in y and pressures and we just want to rearrange it so it's node centric node 1 node 2 node 3 and momentum in x momentum in y and continuity momentum in x momentum in y and continuity uh, for each of these and this is just nodes 1 nodes 2 and nodes 3 and this little thing here is just doing that rearranging nothing more I, I can't even remember how I do it but something very clever it looks I'm not sure I could decipher how that works right now but uh, it just swaps the equations around and then what it does is it sends this uh, stiffness matrix in its right form back to the main program and it solves it so let's see if we can solve a very simple problem doing it. Um, let's see what we have here. So you know the geometry that we're looking at? It's this. Let's look at the data file that we're trying to do to represent this. So remember this. Nodes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This length is 2. This length is 2. This length is 2. And so what is, that, what is our data matrix, data input? Uh, node 1, um, what, well, these are what, total number of nodes were 6, 
total number of elements were four, as you remember. Total number of degrees of freedom per node are three. Velocity x, velocity y, pressure. Uh, did I just change something? Thank you. Um, nodes per element are three nodes. Number of materials, uh, it's only one, but we can put in two. Number of dimensions, x and y, two dimensions. That solves, stores enough storage locations for us to do it. Node number one, x0, y0. Node number two, x2, y2. X. You know how this works now. Uh, we have material types. Uh, fluid density is one. We're not going to use it. Uh, fluid viscosity is one. We will use that. And it's the same for both uh, elements that we have. Element locations, um, what's this? This is element number one. This is material number one. We actually only use one material, right, for each of these. And uh, element one is nodes one, two, and four. Element number two is one, four, and three. Three is three, four, and six. The other one is not sure. So we have those. Um, and now what do we need to do for our boundary conditions? So now we have three degrees of freedom. These are our six nodes. You remember how we prescribe them? We prescribe them as the kind of uh, boundary condition and the magnitude of that boundary condition. First column is velocity in the x direction, velocity in the y direction, pressure. So I guess we're prescribing at node 1 a velocity in the x direction, a velocity in the y direction, and a pressure. At node 3 we're not prescribing a velocity in x, we're not prescribing a velocity in y, and we're prescribing a, a pressure. And the magnitude at 1 is going to be a velocity in the x direction of zero, a velocity in the y direction of zero, global coordinate system, of course, and a pressure of one. So all three, velocity, velocity, pressure, velocity, zero, velocity, zero, pressure is one. And we did three as well. So what's three? We have Velocity in x is not prescribed, a velocity in y is not prescribed, but a pressure is prescribed. And from the bottom one, that pressure of node 3 is equal to 1. And on this boundary, the pressure is 0. On this boundary, the pressure is 1. And so hopefully it's good to go. Let's see, the moment of truth, of course. Uh, I'm not going to trudge through all the um, output, but I think um, it should be set to run. And you can do this yourself. It's a little, I, well, yeah, I guess I, I made it large so you could actually see it. So, well, you'll get some feel for this. So, all the in input information. This is the K Roman 2 matrix in X, K Roman 2 matrix in Y, uh, the first order in X and first order in Y. Those are the matrices that we define. I think it's missing out the third column there. Um, they get placed into this 9 by 9 matrix. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So this top, these 
top three columns here. I can't do it, right? The, the top, top left-hand three columns are the second order in x, y, I think, multiplied through by viscosity. Uh, anyway, but I won't go through all that. You can uh, look at that if you so wish. Let's go to the meat of this and see whether the results make sense. The matrix equation that we have, as you recall, is kind of like, you said this is F equals K times velocities, right, in kind of generic speak. So you remember we prescribed some boundary conditions and we solve for the magnitudes of the dependent variables, which are velocities. So as you look at this output here, that's exactly what you have. This is the force vector, which is the left-hand side which could, should give some numbers. But the more interesting one is the velocity vector, which is this right-hand side. And so let's look at what the individual components uh, on this would be. And I guess I can't draw on this, can I? Remember, it's arranged so that the first three terms are for node 1, second three terms are for node 2, third three terms are no, node 3, etc. And in each of those, the the, um, the order is velocity in the x direction, velocity in the y direction, and pressure. It just repeats in each time, right? So this is uh, velocity in the x direction at node 1, 0. It comes out with what you should do. Velocity in the y direction at node 1, 0. Pressure is equal to 1. Well, that's not very difficult because we've prescribed all of those. Node number 2, velocity in x, 0. Yes, it's stuck to the boundary. Velocity in y is 0, and the pressure is prescribed is 0 also. Next node up, node 3. Um, so if you do this calculation, I didn't, but if you do this calculation at 2 meters, sorry, at 1 meter height, this ends up to be exactly a velocity of 3 meters a second. This is a velocity of 4, it's whatever the units are. And so the true magnitude should be 3. So let's see, 1, 2, 3. So this is first node, second node. So this is node 3. The velocity in x is 2.8, 2.98. That's almost 3. The y velocity is 0 in all of these cases. Pressure is as prescribed. Downstream of that at node 4, the velocity is 3. Close enough. Um, y velocity is 0. Pressure is prescribed as 0. The third, this is the fifth node. Velocity at this node should be 4. It's actually 3.8 uh, in x. The velocity in y should be 0, as it should be everywhere. Prescribed pressure is 1. And on the right-hand side, in the middle of the flow, the velocity should be 4, the y velocity should be 0, and the pressure is prescribed as 0. And then we have all these other numbers that I'm not sure are very important to us. So that, that's it. And so it's not so, yeah, I realize it's kind of, we've been jumping around and doing some strange manipulations, but, but the point I think is that now we have second order, first order, zeroth order equations in fine elements. We have them, we derive them for scalar variables, but we can equally well apply them to vectoral variables because the velocity in this is vectoral variable. And if we know what our PDEs actually look like, we can try assembling them kind of heuristically, I guess. The same way as in the first time we met, we developed an expression for the, uh, the permeability or the stiffness matrix for a linear element was conductivity times area divided by length, 1 minus 1 minus 1, 1. We did that just by writing Darcy's law is equal to AK um, delta H as well. And if we looked at flows into here and the length of this, we could actually write this equation twice and we get each of these two lines. What we've done today is really no different from that. It's just getting a bit more complicated. But we're taking what we understand about the physical processes that we're dealing with and we're starting to assemble it to be able to make, um, get results out of it. So that's the first take-home message. I think the other take-home message is that you need to get used to validating what you do against something that you can be sure of. This is a solution that we have that is well known, any simple solution that allows you to be able to, well, 
Otherwise, you just say, well, it's three here, it's four here. Well, I don't know what it should be. But if you know what it should be from some solution, then you get some uh, decent picture of whether what you're coding, or if you're using ComSol, whether the solution that you're solving in ComSol or other codes actually makes sense. And of course, the fact that we don't get three and three and four and four here is why? No, we use the same. We use two materials, but we use the same viscosity, the same material um, in this component here. So it's no, and so it doesn't want to do it. Doesn't so we use we th we d prescribe two materials, but we only use one of them. These this rows of ones means that we only actually reference one. So what are the reasons? Too coarse. Mesh is too coarse. So you're trying to pick up this curve boundary. Maybe you need 10 elements, not two. Two elements. That's, that's the reason. Steady state, so we don't have to worry about discretization in time, but we do have to worry about discretization in space. So, so uh, we talked about Navier Stokes. You can play around with this if you so wish. This is kind of our entree now. So we started talking about problems where we have not just scalar variables, but also vector variables. Velocities, x, y, and z. Forces x, y, z. So now we'll look at the other case of solid mechanics, which also has a very straightforward physical derivation, if you like, to get the, the system matrices. And here, as I say, just to remind you, we're solving momentum balance. Uh, we're using two different constituent equations. Newton's law of viscosity, apply a stress, you get a velocity in a fluid. Hooke's law, you apply a stress, you get a permanent displacement in a solid. That's the only difference. Uh, we won't do it for uh, transient problems. Uh, we'll just do it for steady state problems with no inertia for solid mechanics, but, uh, but that's basically it. So solid mechanics is next. Once we've done that, then we'll start linking things like fluids and porous media and solid behavior, poor, poor mechanics, and poor mechanics with transport, uh, and start using ComSol to do that. So that's the plan. All right, thank you. That was fun. Wasn't that fun? Thank <laughs> you.